I'm Kel Bigelow. I'm from Purdue University, part of our uh, five-member turf team. You'll see the title of this one is Annual Bluegrass Quote-Unquote Suppression Programs uh, for Creeping Pet Grass Golf Turf. So I use the word suppression there because a lot of my colleagues try and use the word control. And I think that if you're old enough and been around the industry for a long enough period of time, uh, realizing that control is going to occur is uh, a little bit far-fetched, I think. So people have been trying that for a number of decades. But uh, a little bit of contact information on there. If you ever want to get a hold of me, I always like to talk turf when, uh, when I can squeeze it in. And uh, you know, being active in social media, if you want to follow me on the Twitter, uh, there is a Twitter handle there, and also we have one uh, at Boilermaker Turf is our uh, program's Twitter handle, and we have turf tips and uh, a variety of other things there. You know, certainly uh, golf has had a lot of interesting um, challenges in the last uh, five, six years, and uh, as part of that, one of the things that has been happening is uh, we've started to look at costs a little bit more carefully than we had in prior generations um, of managing golf turf. And so one of the things that's always been of interest to me all the way back, you know, 20 plus years, uh, back to my master's at Virginia Tech, we were looking at a project related to uh, annual bluegrass, creeping bent grass, um, ecology and, and population management. But one of the things that sort of popped up as we went through the economic downturn uh, was the idea of which species is a better species. Is creeping bent grass better than annual bluegrass? I think that if you go into any sort of conference setting and you want to spark some discussion, certainly in the cool humid region, of you know which species is better, you'll get a, a lot of different opinions on creeping bent grass and annual bluegrass. There's some great annual bluegrass spotting surfaces. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but one of the things that we started to look at it with one of my master's students was, you know, which is a better species? And so. The, big, the, the key questions here is, you know, which is more reliable, which is more persistent, which is more seasonally consistent, because as golf course managers, one of the things that you're charged with is this idea of trying to provide consistent playing conditions throughout the entire season, yes? I mean, ideally, you know, it should be the same in April as it should be in October. The reality is it's not always that way. Uh, but the, the plant sometimes has a little bit to do with that. But the other interesting question that came up is, is there a difference in terms of maintenance costs? You know, certainly as places were asked, you know, 10% a year uh, to try and carve some money out of the budget, uh, this became more and more uh, acutely aware to the people. What we ended up finding out was that if we looked at creeping bent grass versus annual bluegrass, and on the left-hand side you see a pie chart, right-hand side you see a pie chart. The different colors in the pie chart are different management inputs, and basically what you look at is the left-hand side is the creeping bent grass with few diseases and um, really no moss issues. You're looking at about $103,034 for three acres of creeping bent grass putting green surfaces, and then $122,000, uh, almost five for three acres of annual bluegrass surfaces that would also have annual bluegrass weevil, which is not here yet, but my guess is at some point it might end up here uh, in the Midwest. Not, you know, economically, you know, not a big difference, $1,000 for, you know, three acres for a lot of regions in the United States. Maybe that's, you know, dropping the bucket, bucket for their budgets. Uh, but in a lot of other facilities that, you know, we have in the state of Indiana, a number of facilities that are being managed on about $300,000, $350,000 a year, that $10,000, $20,000 actually is quite a bit for them. So uh, we were able to show that uh, annual bluegrass could uh, be more expensive to maintain than creeping bent grass. If you wanted to use some herbicides, you know, these are some, uh, a list of the products that might be out in the marketplace that uh, would be available to you to try and manage any bluegrass. Certainly there's some pre-emerge types of products that people have used over the years to try and suppress any bluegrass. And uh, there has been some, um, uh, some literature that has shown that these can be effective. Uh, my sense from the golf course side of things is most golf course managers for certainly greens, tees, and, and possibly fairways are a little lukewarm on putting down pre-emergent herbicides for lots of reasons. You know, whether it's root pruning or affecting overseeding programs or whatever you're into. So that tends not to be the most viable choice for a lot of people. Um, we have these other products that have been in the marketplace and you can see several generations of the next best thing since sliced bread. You know, I was looking at an article from uh, one of our colleagues, Dr. Branham, from the 80s. You know, that seems like such a long time ago. And that's when Prograss kind of came into the marketplace. And I was like, Prograss is it, guys. It's got to be it. And then suddenly things like Velocity came along. Nope, this is the one. This is the one. Next best thing. Then we had Zonerate that came along, and now we've got Poa Cure. And there seems to be some, uh, you know, some information that's encouraging with the Poa Cure. 
Um, but again, time will tell as far as whether or not the industry adopts these things and, and if there's a comfort level there. Usually if we're looking at the passive types of programs, that's going to involve one of these plant growth regulators. Okay, we have a number of plant growth regulators there in the marketplace. Nothing really new and exciting coming into the marketplace right now. Uh, but what you have on this is you got the uh, left-hand column being our um, uh, active ingredients for our plant growth regulators and some trade names in the middle column. The thing I want you to pay attention to, though, is the far right-hand column of site of uptake. Okay? We've had, uh, in our program and a number of other programs, very, very good results with the plant growth regulators that are reabsorbed in terms of suppressing any bluegrass. And you know, trade name types of things, this would be cutlass and trimming. Okay, or turf enhancer for those of you that have been around for a while and uh, familiar with that particular product. Those products can be very, very effective when used properly for suppressing the bluegrass populations. And so products like Primo, although they are um, very, very good uh, plant growth regulators, as far as suppressing any bluegrass, uh, you're going to get uh, minimal results in terms of uh, decreases in populations. Next slide I want to show you is uh, a study that we did, uh, it's getting close to 10 years ago, uh, but looking at uh, a fairway renovation type of program. So this was an area that was a mixed stand of annual bluegrass, creeping bedgrass, and basically what we did is in the fall of the year is we went in, uh, applied glyphosate, and renovated the turf with L93 fairway creeping bedgrass. Then we came in the next spring, and I was going to put out some research plots. And if you look at this slide, you can see you know, some little wispy kinds of light yellow um, areas throughout the turf. Again, annual bluegrass seed heads, late May, early June, not uncommon in West Lafayette. I'm not sure exactly when your seed head period is here in Wisconsin. My guess is it's probably about the same time for uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a strong seed head period. But what I'm showing you there and, and trying to illustrate is how much annual bluegrass do you think is in that turf? Again, you just sold your board on, hey, we're going to do fairway renovation. And we're going to clean this up. We're going to have more consistent fairways going forward. It's going to be easier for our staff. You know, less of the disease problems, on and on and on. I mean, however you sold it. Okay, you come back. You did all the right things last fall. And you come in and like, crap. Look at what junior bluegrass is in there. What if I don't do anything? Okay, all I'm going to do is mow, hurt, throw some water, and go. What's going to happen? How much junior bluegrass do you think is in that photo? If you had to guess. 5%, 10%? Maybe it's, it's probably in that 10 to 15, all right? Now, note the number here, 3rd of June, 2005. Here it is, April 2007, two years, okay? And if you go backwards, well, there's a little plot mark on the left-hand corner. Let's go two years. Here's that same plot marker. What happened to that turf where you did nothing? You went from, you know, maybe 80 to 90% creeping bent grass to now how much creeping bent grass? Okay. And then you look at the squares above that, these are areas that we'd actually applied regular applications. They're not completely clean. Again, I talked about suppression programs when I opened this discussion. They're not completely clean, but the consistency of those fairways with those regular programs of those root-absorbed PGRs, much less annual bluegrass in those particular situations. So the cautionary tale is just because you plant the new bent grass, you can't just do nothing, especially if there's quite a developed annual bluegrass seed bank that's there, right? So what do we find out? Well, we knew that based on prior research, okay, after one year, you can usually get some pretty significant uh, reductions in annual bluegrass just by using a, um, uh, a plant growth regulator. With our fertilizer source, again, we had a complete fertilizer, 20-20-20 versus uh, urea. Would you expect there to be a whole lot of difference? Well, that's one of those things that might be a maybe. After the first year, no difference based on the, uh, the fertilizer by itself in terms of the annual bluegrass reductions. But by the second year, again, after two full growing seasons, we started to actually see some differences starting to uh, uh, manifest themselves in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the annual bluegrass uh, populations. What I, I really want you to take home with this is um, the idea that, you know, think about your program very, very carefully. Think about what does that nitrogen need for your particular facility. You know, think about things that certainly Dr. Sold out and you know, colleagues of, of ours that work in the, in the soil fertility arena. The soil testing part of this, are your soil test rates as far as, you know, is this minimum level, minimum level of sustainable nutrition? You know, where are your phosphorus rates in the soil? Do you really need to apply phosphorus? You know, and, and are the applications of phosphorus potentially going to affect some things in your turf? Um, the other thing is, like I started out with, was this idea of suppression. These products will be effective, but they're not always going to be effective. Realizing that this plant, this annual bluegrass plant, is so biologically diverse, 
that it kind of adapts and changes. And you might have good success for three or four years, and then suddenly you're like, you know, something's not working anymore. And it could be that you've selected out some plants that you know, just aren't uh, susceptible to your program anymore. And uh, it just is what it is. You know, then you've got to try something different. You just kind of keep moving forward.